Okay, and then we're going to be starting in 40. Okay. Going live in two seconds. Thank you. Okay, Nan. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am so glad you're here. I was just thinking that I believe this is the first time I've done a cooking class. It's been now two, almost two years that I've been doing the recipes for longevity cooking class with Lifestyle Medical. And I believe this is the first class I've done without any equipment other than a stove, um, well, and ultimately a refrigerator. So how fun is this? You could do this in your camper um, easily. And I'm gonna show you some techniques and I'll explain uh, why I call this recipes for longevity in just a bit, but first I wanna welcome you all. We have people here from Lifestyle Medical. I will let you know that I can't see anything it's not like a Zoom group where I can look at participants. I don't see anything but really what I'm doing so I know what's on camera. And I'm so glad you're here. I can't wait to hear who you are. I usually ask Marissa, so is so-and-so here or so-and-so? Uh, I always want to know. And um, I also want to welcome those from the Gosky Center. I'm delighted that you have joined us. I have no idea how many we will be tonight, but that's the other thing I ask. So how many did we have? So what I'm going to do is start as I normally do with the things that take the longest and then work down to the things that take the less time. And then I lay out what would be a meal for you. And although I don't have to do this, if you watch cooking classes, you'll see that quite often you're getting a recipe uh, and maybe a series of items that are put together uh, to make that that particular dish work. Um, but I like to, and I've been doing this, uh, give you a meal. So today's meal is a balanced meal. It's going to start with a delicious pumpkin carrot soup that's perfect for this time of the year. And I'll talk to you about making your own broth and saving money that way, but actually... Um, being uh, proactive and not throwing things away and not wasting food. So we'll talk about that soup while it's cooking. We'll put together the ingredients for a cornmeal cake citrus um, or a, a cornmeal citrus cake that's not a cake at all. If any of you have uh, traveled to Europe or you're familiar with the Italian cuisine. I'm Italian, I grew up with this. Uh, different parts of Italy offer different things. Polenta is very popular in, gosh, is it the south of Italy? And in the north it's pasta, or I have it backwards. Um, but we're going to do, it's really like a, a sweet polenta cake. It's delicious days later because you serve it cool. I like it slightly warm. So we'll, we'll talk about that and I'll show you what we mean by citrus zest. I hope you have the recipe. 
If you don't, Marissa posted it, I believe, in the chats area so that you can um, easily find it and maybe split screen and see it on screen, but at least know that you're going to get the recipe because I don't spend the additional time to give you the amounts of every ingredient that I use. And then we'll finish with a salad because that, instead of even tossing it, I'm going to assemble it the way I do for my husband and I, and that is my husband and me. And that is, um, I'll just put it on a bowl and it's going to be a nice big bowl. And I'll talk to you about the value of the greens that we're using for this, but I'll let you wait on that one. In the meantime, I'm going to take you over to my stove uh, to get you started with the soup. And then we'll come back to the counter in a minute. The reason I call this class Recipes for Longevity is that I believe, actually, I know that the most important thing we can do for our body, bodies, is to choose the foods that we eat as close to nature as possible. In lifestyle medicine, we call it whole food plant-based. You don't have to be completely plant-based. I am. My husband and I haven't eaten animal products in, well, it's almost two years now. And we get our protein and all of our nourishment from plant foods. And we like it that way. We love our foods. Uh, but if you simply add more of this kind of meal, whole food, plant-based, no um, artificial ingredients, more importantly, it's not, um, it's not uh, processed. The foods we're eating is, well, most of them as close to nature as you can get, except maybe the cornmeal, which is whole corn dried and then ground. I'm warming up my pot because we're going to get this soup started. And I'm putting in, if you look at your recipe, it calls for one big onion, one large onion. It's about two cups and four large carrots. It comes up to about two cups. It's so hard to tell what a large carrot is. I go to the uh, Whole Foods Market. I don't mean Whole Foods. We don't have one near here. But I go to, um, oh gosh, let's say Clark's that happens to be near me. And a carrot can be this big. I go to the La Sierra Whole Foods Market and a large carrot might be that big. So that's why we've given you um, some quantities, two cups of each. And normally, I'm not going to do it tonight, but this is just a technique. Normally, I start with onion because onion is much more moist. And actually, I'll show you what I mean. If I started with onion, what happens is I let the onion, I don't have to do this perfectly, I would let the onion sort of weep. Because onions have a lot of moisture in them, they will release a lot of their moisture and it starts to slightly brown. I don't want to make this too hot. This is a four quart pan that I'm using right now. And it starts to brown and it starts to um, slightly caramelize. The recipe said add broth as you need to. I'll do that in a minute. And why do we do this? Why this step? This step with onion and garlic and then to, then carrot. But the whole thing can be done at once. I'm just kind of doing what I want to do here. Uh, just because I like that extra flavor of the caramelization of the onion. We do this because of just that. We get those juices to caramelize. They become much more flavorful than if I put in carrot and onion, garlic and seasoning, and threw in the broth immediately we would have a soup that, well, ultimately flavorful, but maybe not as flavorful as it could be if we simply took caramelize our vegetables first. And what I'm also going to do is I'm also going to brown the spices somewhat, toast the spices. You do this a lot in European, especially the Middle Eastern and Indian cuisines, where you put your spices in, Toast them delicately. You don't want to burn them because they can get bitter. For example, you'll sell them, if ever, 
put garlic in at the same time that you put onion in because onion has the juice that is released and caramelizes. The garlic can actually burn, and if garlic burns, it becomes bitter. Onion doesn't necessarily, but garlic does. So what I'm seeing here is I'm getting a little bit of brown from the onions, and there's plenty of moisture in them. I don't have to add broth yet until they start to stick a little bit and brown a little bit. And I'm loving the aroma. I'm going to throw in the carrot. You don't have to do that part because if you're using the carrot and the onion, the onion is still going to add that additional moisture. But um, let me put this down for now. But I chose to do that. And I'm going to let it just brown lightly. I'm going to put it a tiny bit higher for just a couple of minutes. And then we'll add some other ingredients. I'm going to step away and get this out of my hand. I had, as it related to nutrition, always assumed that onions and garlic were aromatics. They're highly flavorful. But I never realized that these alliums, and allium is a, a um, botanical descriptive for onions, garlic, leeks, shallots, chives, oh gosh, what else? Um, anyway, the vegetables in the onion family, well, they are highly nutritious. They are very helpful in um, building up your immunity. And, and you've heard me say this before, now this is browning just slightly, you see I still and this is a decently high fire. I, now, I have a good pot here. Uh, it's worth getting cookware. These are all clad, but you don't have to spend what all clad expects. There are other good brands that give you a nice thick layer at the bottom that is that helps distribute heat and helps protect from burning. A too thin base is going to cause burning almost every time. Um, so the alienase, the garlic and onions and leeks and chives and shallots and I know I'm missing a few of them, are not only nutritious but they add a lot of flavor and they are nutritious both raw and cooked. As a matter of fact, if you any of you follow Joel Furman who wrote Eat to Live, gosh, a decade and a half ago, he loves his nutritarian plan. Nutritarian meaning if you're going to eat, why not eat the things that are going to serve your body beautifully? Love the food that loves you back. And I'm going to add the garlic now. And what you're going to see, and you're going to read this. I, I'm, I don't mean to assume that you don't know how to cook, but some of you don't spend a lot of time in the kitchen, so it will sound like I mean that, and I don't. If a recipe says... Um, saute the onion until it is translucent. You'll see kind of what that means. It does. It becomes softer and it becomes translucent. I don't have a piece that's not. Uh, it becomes more opaque. No, not opaque. It, well, translucent. Uh, and softer. And that's exactly what you want it to do because that means it's releasing Again, some of those juices, those juices are caramelizing. I've just added the garlic. I'm going to let that sit for just a minute or two. Oh, and this is what I love. You see right here this little bit of brown. Now, I'm going to show you what happens. I'm going to add a touch of broth. Um, well, I'll have to bring it over to you. Now, what happened when I did that, oh, it's not going to work for me to bring it to you. What happened is it bubbled up. The brown bubbled up, got thick and somewhat syrupy, and then cooked back down again. What it did was it just did something the French and the Europeans have talked about forever when you um, cook in a classic French way, for example. Uh, and a, not, a lot of you know this with just everyday cooking. You may not use this term. You deglazed it. 
For example, if you make a, um, <laughs> I was going to say a steak, and I thought, well, don't do that. Let's see. Well, let's do it with vegetables, exactly what I'm doing now. And they start to slightly brown, whatever you cook browns. You could take that food off the fire or off out of the pan, and you can just add a little bit of, sometimes it's wine, sometimes it's broth, sometimes it's a um, uh, water, and it bubbles up. Uh, turns a little syrupy and then cooks back down and you just again further caramelize the flavors. Now what I'm going to add is, you know what, I thought I added garlic, that's funny, but I haven't. What did I add? Hard to say. Maybe I didn't add anything, I was just talking too much and not paying attention. So let the garlic just kind of cook a little bit in there. And then I'm going to add the spices. And what spices did we use? Because this is a winter soup, I'm adding nutmeg and ginger and cinnamon. You know what I could have done if I didn't have these spices, but I had a pumpkin pie spice mix? I could have just added that. It wouldn't be exactly the same, and it wouldn't be in these proportions, but I'm still trying to add that aroma of the seasons. All right, the garlic has had a chance to cook a little bit, but not brown. I'm going to add the seasonings that I already put in. It was mainly cinnamon, teaspoon of cinnamon, half a teaspoon of nutmeg, quarter teaspoon of ginger. And now I'm letting them brown a little bit. Not really brown, I'm just toasting them. And herbs and spices, powerhouses of nutrition. So back to Joel Furman, his nutritarian diet. He recommends that you eat onions and that you eat them, before this gets too sticky, I'm going to go ahead and put my broth in, that you eat them both raw so that you can get some of the elements in them that um, cook away, but also eat them cooked because some of those elements aren't um, bioavailable if you don't cook them. So you want them cooked, a little bit of cooked and raw. That's why one of the best ways to eat a soup is, or a stew, and I'm putting in five cups of broth. Now what you saw here in this cup, the one that I poured from, I had poured my own broth. This is always in the refrigerator because I make my own broth. I store it in four cup containers. This is a quart in the freezer because I get quite a number of those when I do a pan full, about a seven quart, eight quart um, pan. Um, oh, let me put the rest of this in. This will, this will make five quarts, sorry, five cups of broth. Now, what I'm using here, I bought, and I don't like it as much. First of all, by doing this, I just paid somebody else to make broth with things that I probably otherwise threw away if I was cooking vegetables. This is what I just pulled out of my freezer. Last night, we had asparagus. There's my row of asparagus bottoms, because quite often the bottoms are tough, and you break it where it breaks. The upper part is tender. The bottom part, a lot of people throw away. Uh-uh. That went in here. The carrots from the, um, the four large carrots, the carrot shavings went in here. Here's even a red bell pepper seed pod. You take those out when you're making, you're doing anything with bell peppers. The stems of cilantro and parsley. This goes on and on. Well, tomorrow I'll cook this in a pot, strain it, and that's going to become more of my own broth so I don't have to buy this. But I always keep that around just in case. But again, I prefer my own broth because this would have all been thrown away. If you're cooking and you're cooking a lot of vegetables as you want to, uh, a lot of that would be thrown away if you didn't, uh, if you didn't save it, because that's not the part that you're necessarily going to eat in many cases. All right, now I'm adding to this 
This is organic pumpkin. You don't have to use organic, and I'll tell you why almost everything I buy is, because the only way I can be guaranteed not to have and not to get pesticides, even though there are some organic pesticides, um, they are mainly benign and herbicides. And the, the, least urban, the least benign herbicide that most of us, if we had blood work looking for it, would have in our bodies is glyphosate. That's Roundup. It's a nasty thing. And the only way I can guarantee that it's not in these foods is by buying organic. Because it's used in massive crop um, production so that they can do massive amounts of um, planting and not have to weed it in any other way other than over the top of the plant, spraying the glyphosate, which then doesn't kill the plant but kills the grasses under it. So what I'm going to do, oh, I'm adding to that, if you look at your recipe, uh, the seasoning, and I'm going to add a tablespoon, and I don't have to, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's part of the recipe, and I actually like it slightly sweet, a tablespoon of maple syrup. Some people don't eat any of the processed uh, sugars. And one thing you could do if you like things slightly sweet, and the syrup I used was organic um, maple syrup. One thing that you can do is to um, use make date syrup. And you take a cup of dates, cup of water, uh, soak the dates, blend it, and you end up, it's not so much a syrup as a paste, and you can use that to sweeten things. And the paste is very, very tasty, it, but it, it still holds the fiber from the dates. And so it ties up a lot of that sugar into something that doesn't hit your bloodstream right away. And so it lowers its glycemic index. So I'm going to get this out of the way. And we'll get to this. And while you do later. that. Yes. There is the question. Um, yes. If there's any... Vegetables that should not go in the broth, maybe because they're too strong oh. in flavor, yeah. not easily? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for asking me that. I, I used to always put in broccoli stems and cauliflower uh, cores and um, leaves and um, kale stems. I still put in kale stems, but what I've learned is if I put too much of that... And if you think about a cauliflower, that's a lot. And the stems of broccoli, you can eat the stems of broccoli after you peel them. But sometimes you get some real big woody stems. I found that it made the broth, um, it wasn't so much bitter as it was just so, um, uh, well, the nightshades have a really strong flavor. And it, it drowned out the softer flavors. So I don't have, in this entire bag, I don't believe I have any nightshades at all. I have, for example, the bottom of my green onions, a couple of peeled uh, garlic, a lot of carrot. Carrot sweetens it nicely. A lot of onion ends, like green onion uh, greens. Um, and the thing about the bitter, what you're going to get bitter from is, one of the things, is the onion skins, garlic skins, skins of, for example, um, uh, eggplant. So those things I wouldn't use because I don't know that you're going to like the flavor if you do that. It, it changes the flavor of your broth. So I'm going to bring this to a boil, cover, lower it, and we're going to cook it for 30 to 35 minutes. I'm going to bring the camera around just a moment. Okay. And we're going to go back to the stove in just a moment to cook our polenta cake and actually to turn this lower when it comes to a boil. But first, I wanted to show you something because if you look at the recipe and if you don't have it, you don't have it printed, it's okay. One of the things it calls for is lemon zest. Now, how do you do lemon zest? Well, there are some simple tools. For example, I use this forever. This is just where, let me get on the camera. This is, oh, well, you know what? I don't have my glasses on. Ah, now I can see better. Uh, 
this is um, a grater that's a little bit um, more, uh, the pieces are larger, so it's not as fine. And I used this for years, but I love the microplane. The microplane uh, grates with a tiny, tiny little fiber so that you are, this sort of melts into the, whatever you add it to. And the one tablespoon of grated lemon, and they call it zest, and this is it. And you're going for the yellow. You're not going for very much at all of the white under it because that that is pithy and it gets a little bit bitter. And one lemon like this will give me one tablespoon, so I'm not even going to measure it. And get your fingers out of there, even though it doesn't stand up high enough to do any real damage. It'll grate your nails and you don't want to have to and to deal with that in your lemon zest. And oh my gosh, the aroma that it releases from a lemon is so beautiful. Um, so, so um, well, that, that fresh and crisp uh, aroma of a lemon, of, of any citrus. Okay, so I have from this one lemon a tablespoon. And I do want to recommend something. If you're going to, if, if I didn't already have my lemon uh, measured, I would have zested it first and then I would have squeezed it. If I squeeze it and then try to zest it with this sort of collapsed empty shell, it's much harder to do. So if you can remember, uh, that's a recommendation doesn't mean you're always going to remember. Sometimes I get carried away and before I know it, the thing is squeezed and I haven't zested and I'll still go back and do it. It's just more difficult. Um, any other questions, Marissa? Okay, so I'm going to bring this back to the Not stove. Right okay. And you're going to follow me around. Okay, so our soup has just started to boil. I'm going to turn it to low, and somebody clock me. Well, you don't really have to. I think I'll be okay doing it, but I'm looking for, I think we'll finish with the soup at just a little bit after, um, this is 6.30, a little bit after 7, and that'll be perfect. Now, I don't know if you've ever made cornmeal before. Well, I know what I should say, grits. I'll bet you some of you have made grits. This is just like grits. You know what I'm looking at? It looks like my, um, my stove has shifted that little thing there because the fire is coming out funny. Uh, I don't think I'm going to worry about it. Okay. Oops. All right. So, the first thing I'm going to do is get, hold on, okay, the ingredients. Actually, I think I know what I'll do. I prefer to work on this corner, so I'm going to put this on here, put it on low. Can you still see well enough? Sure you can. As a matter of fact, take a look at our soup. There. You can see it's very brothy, but when I by the time I finish, you'll see what we've created. Um, that changes this quite a bit. Okay. Cover it again and let it cook. All right. Now, I'm going to put two cups of plant milk. I could have used any plant milk and I chose uh, soy milk. I'll tell you why. Because, well, I like the flavor of soy milk, but also it has protein. The others have a minimal amount, like 
next to nothing. Almond milk is one gram of protein per cup. Uh, soy has gotten a bad rap. Some people think that it um, will cause problems in your body, but the most recent um, the most recent studies find that actually it's the populations that eat the most soy that have the less, least problems with breast cancer, with uh, all kinds of cancers, uh, with including testicular um, and prostate problems um, because it doesn't, it binds to the estrogen receptors and keeps the estrogen that comes in from foods, especially the meats we eat and parts and some of what our body produces um, from actually uh, binding to the receptors, our own estrogen and endogenous estrogens binding to the receptors, which is more dangerous if it is um, other estrogens other than phyto, which means plant-based estrogens like the soy estrogen. Okay. All right. Leave that alone, man. All right. So what's going into here is first the cornmeal. And I want to show you what that looks like. This is just now I started. This is this is um, something to note. I used um, medium grind cornmeal, but I only had a half a cup of it. But I had quick grits, which was much more finely ground for the other half of a cup. I think this is going to give my cake uh, a um, less grainy uh, texture. And I think I'm going to like that. So I'll put that in as soon as the milk boils. I'm going to be adding to that, and I think I'll go ahead and measure it right now. I'm going to add to that a teaspoon of vanilla, but not now. I'm just going to add that to the lemon juice. And we're going to add, once the grits have cooked, but they only cook for five minutes. That's the cooking of this cake, and that's it. Um, as I'm talking to you, I'll be stirring the grits, and they're going to get thicker and thicker within five minutes. And then they're ready to um, have the other ingredients added. And the other ingredients include chopped almonds. And I want to show you what I use. I use dry roasted slivered almonds because they're skinned. And the, the skin can give a little bit of a kind of a earthy flavor. Um, and in baking, I like not, I like the peeled or skinned almonds. These are slightly toasted. And since this isn't a baked product, I like the slightly, slightly toasted. And because they're slivered, they have a, a nice, um, crunch to start with and then I just chop them just a little bit further and I get these at Trader Joe's. I live near a Trader Joe's. I go there often because I can get organics for hardly anything more than non-organics and the prices are great um, and you come to know what a store has and it just becomes habitual and that's how I feel about it. So this is starting to boil and it's just bubbling around the edges and as soon as it gets going just a little bit more, I'm going to put in the, the, um, the cornmeal. And you'll find if you look for cornmeal that you can find it labeled as polenta or medium grind cornmeal, um, uh, coarse ground. In this case, the quick will be, it's just like quick oats. The only difference between your rolled oats and your quick oats is that one was processed longer than the other. And the least processed, actually, the better, because it means that you're not going to absorb it as quickly. Your body's got that extra fiber to have to fight with before it turns it into glucose in your body. And that's part of what affects the glycemic index. For those of you that are um, being careful about your blood sugar, the more whole grain a thing is, the better. Okay. It's already thickening. But I'm going to cook it and stir constantly. 
for five minutes and it's just bubbling away. And as soon as it gets thick, I'm going to add the other ingredients one at a time. And I'll remind you, let me grab this, of what the other ingredients are for those of you that don't have a recipe in front of you. Boy, this is just bubbling away and getting nice and thick. Uh, we, have, we started with the um, soy milk. It could have been any milk. But by adding protein to this, I have added, I've made this, I'll call it dessert. You could even have it for breakfast if you wanted to. You could cut out a little bit of the honey. I don't know that it needs a half or a quarter of a, what is it, a third of a cup of honey? Um, a quarter of a cup of honey. Uh, you could cut that down a little bit. And this could be even something that you had for a quick breakfast with a cup of herb tea. You could even put a little bit of a nut butter over it to increase its protein, but the nuts we're putting in there are doing that. We have raisins. Those are doing a nice job of adding some iron because there's iron in raisins. Um, and one of the things that you will hear me say from time to time is with your greens, the greens that give you so much calcium like spinach, kale, arugula, that the leafy greens are fabulous for you as it relates to calcium. And if you're eating primarily or fully plant-based, you don't want to ignore that. But one of the things you want to do when you're eating your greens is get some citrus acid in there because the citrus makes the calcium more bioavailable. Well, we're already doing this. In this dish, we don't have greens, but in this dish, we're adding lemon juice and nuts. In this case, almonds. It could be any nut you like. You could add pecans if you like. Um, raisins or currants, if you can find currants. I prefer currants because, and I'll show them to you when we're, I, I sort of decorate the top of this with a few currants sprinkled on. And I like the currants because they're so small, a quarter of a cup of them can give a beautiful um, um, array of that fruit in whatever you're making in a more, uh, a more I want to say homogeneous way. And that's the only word I can think of, meaning that you get more of them as opposed to a quarter cup of raisins that might give me 30 raisins a quarter cup of currants give you 100 currants because they're so much smaller. But the currants that I was getting for a great price, two thirty a pound at the La Sierra market for years, uh, they haven't been able to get them in. So I'm back to raisins again. And we have the vanilla that I added to the lemon juice and then we have some um, honey. I promised Marissa that I would bring some of this to the office for them to taste tomorrow. Okay, now look what's happening. Can you see how thick that is? It pulls away from the pan. It's, um, that's what I'm looking for. Nice and thick. So I'm going to add, let's see, I think I'll start with the nuts. And actually, maybe a little more moisture, so I'll add the honey. And this is a quarter cup. Again, you could add less. You know what I'm thinking I want to do with this next time? I'm going to use date paste. I'm going to use a quarter of a cup of date paste rather than uh, the honey. That's less processed. And some of you who are vegan wouldn't eat honey anyway because of that issue of it not being animal free. Now I'm going to take this out of here and use a spoon because the um, raisins are too big. 
to go through, especially as they expand and fluff up, too big to go through the, the wire whisk very well. Okay, now look. Doesn't that look pretty? Mmm, smells wonderful. You could have fun with this as far as flavors. You could season it. You could use different kinds of dry fruit. I could have used chopped dry apple. I think I'm just about done. And then I'm going to bring this back. Oh, wait, you know what I forgot? Ta da! I forgot the lemon. Lemon juice and the vanilla. Mm -mm -mm. So this is it. This was a cake as opposed to the baking. We've just cooked ourselves a nice batch of grits, sort of. All right. All right, I'm going to carry this here. I'm going to reposition you, and I'll be there in just a moment. Put the pan here. All right. Okay. So I wanted to show you something. I'm going to recommend, even though the original recipe called for this to be made in a prepared, finished in, a 9-inch um, pie pan, I am using a 9-inch square cake pan. The pie pan, and when I made it in that, gave me pretty little slices, pointed slices, 10 to 12 slices. Um, but I prefer it the way I'm going to show it to you today in either squares or sort of, um, what's that? I don't even know what that word would be for something. Well, well, okay. You're going to see that this one was a diamond shape. Uh, in other words, cut this way and then this way so that we have some nice angles rather than simply squares and the squares would have been fine. I want to show you how to use the the um, parchment paper. If you want to save money, buy it at Costco. This, what is this, 205 feet was, I don't even know what I paid, but it was certainly nothing like getting it in a 20-foot roll for 5 or $6, which is sometimes what you pay when you're getting it in a smaller amount from a, a specialty store. And I tore some of the parchment paper. I don't know if you're familiar with parchment paper. It's not wax paper because I don't want the wax to melt on what we're doing. And it doesn't tear cleanly. It, it sort of tears awkwardly, but it cuts beautifully. So I cut a piece there. Perfect. Voila. And it will make it easier for me to get this out of here. When this is cool, I can turn the whole thing over, peel the parchment paper off, put it on a plate, and put it out on a buffet. This I'm going to keep because we have a little, it's called a Breville um, hot air um, uh, air frying, actually toaster oven. And we use it all the time for toast, but we also slice uh, potatoes that have been boiled thin and put them on in a high heat. And it's like potato chips, but there's no fat involved. But it gives us that crispiness. And my husband likes that with his sandwich for lunch. So we do that on a regular basis. And I lay the sliced potatoes on the parchment paper in the, the oven. Okay, so I'm going to take this and I'm just going to... Plunk it in. People, what I'm smelling here is that, oh, man, no. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Do I want to do this? I guess I do. I was going to say, what I'm smelling is that citrus and the, and, I'm, and the vanilla. I'm actually smelling the vanilla. But sorry about the pounding, people. 
I know why I said this. I'm surprised somebody didn't say, Nan, you forgot something. There. Okay, I'll show you what I forgot. Here. All that beautiful zest that will actually make this in terms of flavor. Any chance you get to zest, oh, let me get you back over here, to zest an orange or a lemon, do it. Because do it over a salad, do it um, in a fruit dish, because that, that zest adds so much to a dish. Okay, now I've mixed it in. Get it back on here. And this is getting thicker and thicker. If I talk, <laughs> if I talk too long, um, I'd be fighting it. All right. There we go. Okay. So, I can't help myself. I'm putting the water in it so that later when I clean up, I don't have to jackhammer it all. There we go. And now I'm simply flattening it. There's no oil in here. There's no sugar. There's no egg. There's no butter. This is simply a grain, a whole grain that has been turned into a lovely, cold, slightly sweet, lemony, fruity dessert. And so in essence, it's an extension of your meal of your whole food plant-based meal without your finishing a beautiful meal with something that was processed and sugary, full of preservatives and stabilizers, etc. This is just more of your starch for your meal. You're getting some corn. It's just as processed, but only mechanically not with fake stuff. Okay, now, remember I told you I was gonna show you what currants are. Look, these are currants. See how tiny they are? That's a currant, as opposed to a hefty raisin. So I'm going to, let's see. I'm gonna spread some of these. Let's see if I can do this. Over the top. And then I'm going to push it down a little bit because I like the way that looks. It gives it some um, interest. And then I'm going to take a few of these nuts, and this is what they were like before I chopped them up, put them on it. All right, and press it down. See, it's not sticky because now it's already setting. So these aren't gonna set in it all the way because it's, um, there, look, look at, isn't that pretty? Now, this I won't be cutting tonight. I'll show you what I, by, showing you what I made before, um, how I would serve this. This will have to sit and be in the refrigerator cooling. I'm not going to put this in the refrigerator now. It's simply too hot. You don't put um, hot things in the refrigerator. It brings up the temperature and uh, affects the food that's in there. So... Oh, you know what? I think I'm going to leave this here because I'm going to show you something else. How long has it been? Well, while 
the soup is finishing, I'm going to show you a technique. The salad calls for orange sediment. Hold on a minute. Okay. So the salad calls for orange segments. And the one of the ways that this meal is so beautifully balanced, let me make sure it's still cooking, yes it is, is that the soup, this lovely, spicy fall soup, stick to your rib soup, is highly nourishing. You're getting a lot of fiber, a lot of vitamin A. You've got your allium in there, your onion and your garlic. Um, it's mainly a starch because there's protein in everything. Almost all foods have a percentage of protein in them. So if you're getting enough calories as a whole food plant-based um, enthusiast, if you're getting enough calories, you're getting enough protein. That's just the way it works out. Potatoes are one of the lowest in protein, and they're 10%. The World Health Organization recommends anywhere from 7 to 10 or 12 percent of your calories uh, should come from protein as opposed to Americans who sometimes get 30 to 50 percent of their calories from protein, which is way too much and it's inflammatory. So um, the meal is starting off if you want to start with your soup or the soup can come after the salad or they can be eaten together, you have your basically your vegetable starch in your soup. The salad, because it has beans in it, is where you're going to get your legumes, which give you your main protein source in this meal. Even though we've got the nuts that are giving us protein, we've got the, the um, soy milk that's giving us protein, but I wanna show you, and fresh fruit in the salad. So the salad is going to have orange, if you look at the recipe, and it's called the orange bean and arugula salad. It calls for um, orange segments. And how do you do that? Well, the first thing that I did was peeled the orange. And I peeled it as close as I could to the um, getting rid of as much of the pith as I could. But then... If I have a sharp knife, I can go into the segments, turn the knife, and cut out segments that I can then decorate the salad with. You may want to have your segments. I'm not going to do it for this demonstration. Um, but when I served it to us, I've had this salad several times now. I've learned that I prefer to have it, the, the segments of orange, just because I get more orange that way. But your citrus is so highly nourishing. You know that. That's one thing we all grow up learning, and that is the value of citrus fruit. And... What I want to show you about the orange I'm using is that it's a navel orange. And if you're not familiar with that, hold on just a second while I'm doing this, I'm going to just kind of think. Oops, escapee. Getting these wedges out. These look so pretty, people. And I was at a cooking class decades ago, and it was actually in Napa Valley, and we were being shown a citrus salad, citrus romaine, kale wasn't a big thing back then, decades ago, and what she did after she made the salad, and the salad had um, walnuts on it, uh, in it, and honey in the dressing, she took this and she squeezed it, and there was so much juice in it. I may not squeeze it, but there is no way I'm going to throw this away. I think after class, I'll end up um, I'll put it in the measuring cup. I'll end up eating it because that's loaded with juice and fiber. And it's just not useful for my salad. That's all. 
So look at that. Look how pretty that is. Now this, I keep missing you. There you are. This is going to go on the salad, but not a mass of it because this would be fine for a family of four. Um, unless you were having a huge salad full of beans, maybe even some avocado, and that was going to be your main dish, which actually it is, and then a smaller bit of soup. So you decide. And then you finish it off with a wonderful starch like your corn, and you've got a great meal. And that was sort of the whole point here. I'm going to, at this point, well, let me just check the soup. Here, you can come and check it with me. All right. This just has to be very, very um, soft. I think, I think I'm going to give it just a little more time because I'm not going to use my blender, my Vitamix. I'm going to use, oh, so I, I exaggerated. I said this may be the first class that I haven't used. Uh-oh, sorry that I haven't used an appliance, but that's not so. I'm gonna use a um, wand blender. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So while I'm waiting for that, and that can be the last thing that I do, let's make the salad. So this is called orange bean and arugula salad. I wanna sing the praises of bitter greens. Kale is a bitter green. Bok choy isn't really bitter. Um, spinach isn't really bitter, but they're part of the bitter greens. I'm going to read something to you. Okay, bitter greens. They're nutritional powerhouses. Bitter greens are packed with vitamin A, C, K, minerals like calcium, potassium, and magnesium, filled with folate and fiber, and low in fat and sodium. These greens are powerhouses. So sometimes you have to teach your palate to appreciate something that it otherwise doesn't. It's so easy to eat ice fruit lettuce. The saddest salad on the planet is I, <laughs> it's a wedge salad with iceberg lettuce, a blue cheese, pure fat dressing, and bacon. <laughs> That's a really sad salad because Nutritionally, you're getting next to nothing and your body is screaming under that layer of saturated fat. This salad is a beauty because what it's giving you is the beginning layer of arugula. And if you're not used to it, because it's a little radishy, um, I just told a story to my daughter, my husband's daughter, still my daughter, um, about adapt or adaptation. And I want you to think about this. Uh, my son was young, went through school, in college, he's always been a foodie, never liked onion, I'm mean, sorry, olives, hated olives, hated olives, wouldn't eat olives. But he started going to the culinary demonstrations all over. He went to... Um, Johns Hopkins, and so in Maryland, and then he went to NYU, New York, and he would always go to culinary demonstrations, and he realized that olives were a very popular part of a sort of nouveau, a special cuisine. Um, he graduated from school back in 60, I mean, 96 or something, so this has been a while, and one day he said, I'm going to start liking olives, and he sat down ate some and decided they were delicious. I have a similar story, but it's it's oh it's such a bad example and I'm sorry but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> I always hated beer. Hated beer. I still don't drink beer now cuz it's full of gluten, but um and I can't do that. But hated it. And this was back in I got married in 1970. My late husband and I were in San Francisco and we were driving along and I was reading Time Life culinary books and they were talking about washing down German sausage with tankards of beer and I said my god that sounds so good I'm going to like beer the next place we stopped I got a sausage sandwich with a big thing of beer 
and loved it. You see how, how um, neuroplasticity works. Sometimes it's a matter of just getting used to something. Sometimes it's a matter of just telling yourself. I wish the story had a better uh, antidote in terms of <laughs> what, um, what it was that I was uh, so swayed to have. Uh, but it's still a very good example. Um, I still love beer. I just don't drink it. I think it's really refreshing sometimes. So this is the base of our salad. Bitter greens that are going to be offset with a dressing that's not fat free. And we're not talking about not having fat. We're talking about having fat in its real form, such as tahini, which is ground up sesame seeds, and such as nut butters. And this dressing is exactly that. I'm going to make the dressing in a jar. I have made this dressing before, and if you're going to make it double or triple it, I'm making it exactly like the recipe um, has illustrated in terms of amounts. For example, this is, um, gosh, three tablespoons of almond butter. It's such a nuisance to measure uh, these sticky uh, butters like tahini and almond butter. If you know, and it doesn't matter if it's perfect. So if you know, and it's true, that one quarter cup is four tablespoons and you need three tablespoons, instead of using the tablespoon three times over, wet the cup, your little measuring cup with hot water, and then, you know, dump it out, and then measure your, your um, nut butter to what would be about uh, a tablespoon less. Doesn't matter if it's perfect. It's just easier to get out. So this is three tablespoons, or done the way I said, maybe add some, lose some, I'm not sure, of uh, nut butter. It could have been smooth almond butter. It could have been any other kind of butter, but almonds is really nice with this. Uh, but in this case, it's roasted, crunchy, uh, organic almond butter. And I'm adding to that six tablespoons of orange juice. Look at this beautiful orange. How do I know it's not a Valencia? For those of you that aren't that familiar with oranges, we call it navel for a reason. There it is. Sometimes they're not nearly as pronounced as that, but your um, Valencia oranges will simply have they, they don't even have much definition. This is just the stem end. Um, but that's what I just peeled and showed you earlier. But I wanted to show you this beauty. Um, and they are because this is when they are uh, ripening. Actually, the best time for navels, well, it depends on where you are. But one of the best times for navels is in December, January, uh, February. Um, but they're now hitting the market, and this is a good time to buy them. So I'm going to add the um, six tablespoons of orange juice. And if you have an orange this big, and these were from Trader Joe's. I'm sorry, I keep fiddling. Uh, this was from Trader Joe's, and I think they were maybe 70 or 80 cents for this big guy. Uh, one of these is plenty, and you'll have some left over to sip. And, um, okay, then we add, if you want, and I wanted, a tablespoon of honey. And so we have the almond butter to give it a, a richness to balance out the bitterness of the greens. We have the orange juice to help release the calcium in the uh, arugula. And we have two tablespoons of tamari. Now, in my case, I use organic tamari, anything soy, because soy is one of those crops that they just bomb with glyphosate, with herbicides, with pesticides. I use an organic tamari that's gluten-free. Some of them are not gluten-free, some of the tamaris. Uh, some of the soy sauces are not gluten-free. And um, low fat, I'm sorry, low salt would have even been better, but I can't find an organic 
gluten-free, low sodium. I'd have to give up one of those or the other. And I, I'm not going to give up the organic part. And so that's what I get. And just an idea, because these, this can be kind of pricey. I bought the small bottle. It, I went through it pretty fast because they, the flavor of soy in a lot of dishes is really quite striking and very nice. But they have a, a larger bottle that is um, it's much larger. And so I kept this, and I just pour... We had a second refrigerator in the garage, but I just pour from that larger bottle and I can pour twice into this. And the price is only a couple of dollars more than this was originally. So just a thought, it can get it in a bigger amount. And if you don't have to go gluten free, then don't bother with that either. But so I'm adding the tamari. And what does tamari do? It's a salt substitute. It's really tasty and it has a certain richness to it. And to make this go easily, and for the honey, I just use that cute little bear honey. Uh, I have a whisk, put it in a jar, and just whisk it. If you have a chance, and the seal on something that you buy, sorry, it has this kind of a sealing ring as opposed to that sort of paper thing that goes into the cap. Most of the labels will soak out. And it's so nice. I'm going to walk away for a minute and show you something. And it's so nice to have things in jars because if the jar is nice enough, you can even put it on the table with a spoon in it. This is what I have made for myself. This is one recipe, and I double and triple the recipe because this is so tasty over a salad that I just leave it in the refrigerator that way. Um, okay. And if you want, if you have a little teeny blender to make it more uh, smooth because this has some nuts in it because it's, it's crunchy, then you can do that. But on the other hand, you can also just take your spoon and spoon it over and let some of the nuts be part of what makes this um, add crunch to the salad and that much more flavor. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and design this salad. All right. We have pinto beans. The pinto beans are so tasty. They're almost buttery. I'm adding, oh, probably about a third to a half a cup of beans. That's given me, oh, what, seven to 10 grams of protein in that amount. All right, so pinto beans, drain, organic, drained, um, rinsed, and then drained. And I'm going to put some almonds over it. I'm going to put, and actually I am going to cut these in half just so that we have more orange per bite full. Okay. And again, if this is part of the meal that we're having, you've made the entire meal, you've got a beauty here. All right. And then I'm going to put red onion. Why am I doing onion? We've got cooked onion. Why not add some raw? There we go. And if you wanted, you could add some avocado to this as well. When we're ready, the recipe, by the way, called for doing what I just did and gently, well, putting it in a bowl and gently mixing. Um, because there was nothing I could do with a big bowl of dressed greens tonight and they would be too soggy to eat tomorrow. Uh, I didn't want to do that. Add a little bit more nut for fiber and for protein. And um, so this is actually the way that I prefer a salad where you spoon the amount of dressing that you want on top of it even as you're eating it. Um, so I'm going to leave this here because this is 
part of our meal. I'm going to blend our soup now. So I'm going to have you follow me over. Oh, it's not too hot. All right, now this is how things are going to change. Just a moment. Because what you're looking at, um, I wonder if I put it here, if you can see it better. Sure you can. Okay, good, perfect. All right, this is the blender that I'm referring to. Let me get it on camera. This one happens to be a Cuisinart. These are $20, maybe 30. Now the one thing is, my I'm going to say it, my, um, let me get this plugged in, sorry, there. My concern here is that normally I would have used a larger pot because if this isn't kept in the broth and I'm not careful, I'll end up with it all over the backsplash. And you'll sit there and laugh your heads off and I will not be happy with myself. But this is what this looks like. You have to push, in this case, they do safety precautions with this for a reason because this is just razor sharp and it can go through just about anything including fingers so the first button then the second button now I'm going to insert it this is called a wand blender and I'm just going to sorry for the sound and I'm going to keep it low What I'm getting here is a blended soup without having to deal with trying to get this in the Vitamix. Oops. See what I mean? So let me show you, just a moment, we went from a soup that was sort of a brothy, um, vegetable soup to now a bisque. Can you see that? Look how pretty this is. And we have a meal. Our salad's waiting for us. I'm going to grab a bowl. And I'm going to put our flavorful bisque. You can salt and pepper this. If you notice, I didn't add salt and pepper. Some of you should really watch the salt, salt has quite an effect on blood pressure. Some say it doesn't, but cardiologists that I listen to say it does. And you want to be careful about how much you add. So I'm going to add a sprinkle of pepper. I'm not going to worry about the salt. I'm even going to add a little pepper to this. Isn't this a funny grinder? <laughs> All right. And then, because I want to add a little bit more nutrition, I'm looking for, oh, there it is. I'm going to sprinkle on, this is cilantro. I keep it in a water bath in my refrigerator like a bouquet. Chop it up fresh. I'm going to put some cilantro on here. Can you see? Yes, you can. And then I'm going to sprinkle on some pumpkin seed. 
there. And I'm going to take it a step further. Now this recipe isn't here, but a lot of you have gotten this from me in past, um, in from past classes. I make my own. I call it vegan mayonnaise or vegan sour cream, depending on how much lemon juice I put in it. And all it is is silken tofu. Now, if you don't know what silken tofu is, let me show you something. You may want to grab a paper and a pencil. For $2.50, and sometimes it's less and sometimes it's a little more, I get this package of organic, always organic for tofu and for soy products. Silken means that it's been... Um, that it's been it's been somewhat processed, meaning that they've worded up to the degree that it's it's um, has a uh, a much uh, smoother, well, silkier consistency uh, tofu, and this gets put into the blender or my little food processor with two tablespoons of lemon juice. If I wanted a little more tart, I might even add like a teaspoon of um, of apple cider vinegar. And that could be all. However, I put a little bit of salt, maybe a quarter to a half a teaspoon of salt. I put in some pepper, and then I put in a half a teaspoon each of garlic and onion salt because I like that, the richness in flavor that they give. But I could leave those two out and put it in. When I make it, it will fill up this jar to here. This is a, what is it, a 12-ounce um mason jar and him and I love to put just a dollop of that it could be kind of fun and just do some little bits of it here and here and here and here okay because what this does is exactly what a sour cream would do or something that sort of mellows something out it it um and it adds the additional amount of nourishment including protein so again a 12 ounce package of silken tofu two tablespoons or a little bit more of lemon juice you were it in a blender or a processor or you could even use the whisk it would just probably not be quite as smooth and then some seasoning like onion powder or onion granules and garlic granules and um, every time I eat a soup almost every time I'll put this on this and I was talking to our group today in our group meeting at lifestyle medicine we offer zoom group meetings and we had a number of people on and one of the things that I talked about and I didn't do it with this because I've got the cilantro and we're getting our greens that way could have been parsley one of the things that I talked about is every time you have a soup or a stew, um, if you can, just chop up some fresh, and you saw how I got the um, arugula in the bag. I just get those at Trader Joe's for a couple of dollars. Chop up some fresh baby, preferably organic, but doesn't have to be, uh, spinach, and then just throw it on your hot freshly served or just before you serve it while it's still in the pan soup and mix it in and that that um, spinach adds that much more nourishment loaded with calcium loaded with folate loaded with a k c vitamins um, and adds that much more nourishment and color to your food and then finally when i made my last i call it polenta cake citrus cake. I cut it up and I put it in this piece of Tupperware. This is, gosh, probably six days old and I had a lot more of it, but we snack on this from time to time. I think it's a neat snack. I'll put it in the microwave for maybe 10, 12 seconds to warm it up a little bit. I kind of like it that way, but this is what I will be able to do with that, the one that you witnessed the cooking of when it cools down enough to cut and that's what I meant by the shape 
I'm just doing it. I'm going to pick it up and show it to you. See? Ah! As I said, they're not stuck on there. That little piece of almond came off. But we have the little bits of um, currants. It could have been raisins. And the nuts. And voila. This is our meal tonight. Super nutritious. The dressing. Hold on. A piece of currant. The dressing is then spooned lightly over. And you just kind of stir it in as you're eating it. If you want a little bit more, you get a little bit more. Wow. What a meal. And that's all I've got to say. Do we have any questions or any comments? I'm going to say something while you're thinking about it. This is a plant. I, I don't know. Some of you know that I, I, for a couple of decades, I've done landscape design. I retired a couple of years ago. One of my favorite plants, even though it attracts just almost hives of bees, but the bees are so busy with it. I've never been stung by any of them, and it's right there in my backyard. But this is a marvelous plant. It's called South African basil. It's almost always in bloom. The leaves are so pungently basil, but they're a little hairy, so I don't use them on anything succulent like this. I could throw a little bit of them into my, um, my broth to give that bit of pepperiness that basil has. But they're, they're just so pretty with a lavender tinge to the leaf as well as the flower. Um, and they're a perennial. They'll just keep blooming and stay with you for years. And it makes a nice little bouquet. So that's all I have to say about that. I'll put a couple of the leaves on here just to give us some contrast. There. Okay. Any questions? So there is there was one question. Um, if it's true that artificial vanilla is made from an ingredient from beaver anal glands? I've read that. Yeah, oh. actually, the beaver anal oh. gland have been used to an extract for some culinary foods. I don't know that I heard it was vanilla, but I've heard that it was other flavorings, especially raspberry flavoring. Raspberry, when something says natural flavorings, that would be considered a natural flavoring, and I've and I've read that it it um, is used as a substitute for a raspberry flavoring. Um, but yeah, that apparently <laughs> apparently <laughs> that there's um, a rich flavor back there, down there, whatever. So yeah, that's it's very possible. Yuck. <laughs> Anybody else? And it certainly isn't that, vegan. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for being here and uh, look forward to seeing you next month, second Tuesday of the month. I'm going to do a something that could be used for your holidays, which is going to be a shepherd's pie, a lovely shepherd's pie that you'll be able to experience and then use in your own family gatherings. And um I want to thank uh, Marissa, stay on a minute, if you would. And I want to thank you all for being here. I appreciate you and gosh, wish you all the best. Stay well. Bye, everyone. <laughs>